Good morning. Would you open your Bibles to Luke chapter 9? We'll be looking at verses 10 to 17 today. It's great to be with you. My wife is sorry that she cannot be here. She has walking pneumonia. What's interesting is we were in Utah this week on a mission trip, visiting Travis Kearns and seeing what God is doing through his ministry there, remarkable work there in Utah. We climbed two mountains, including one that was a mile and a high straight up, and all the while she had walking pneumonia. She was kind of lagging behind in the back, and I was kind of chiding for her for that. Turns out she was, had bronchitis, walking pneumonia, and per- potential uh, whooping cough. And so you could be praying for her. Uh, and then I've been trying to stay well in light of the preaching event this morning. And last night, Jim Hamilton had our baseball team out in a storming flood. Uh, the, the, bat, the bats, the Louisville bats, canceled last night, but we're out there practicing <laughs> because we have a 56 game winning streak on the line. All right. Well. Today is a very special day in American history. Uh, Today, April the 14th, 1789, George Washington was informed at his Mount Vernon estate by Charles Thompson, the Secretary of Congress, that he had been elected unanimously as the first president of the United States. It's the only unanimous vote in presidential history, in fact. One of the prevailing themes that the historians emphasize is that even though this man was a war hero, the Revolutionary War, he sensed his deep inadequacy to the position of presidency. Ron Chernow, uh, the biographer, writes, his fears that he lacked the requisite skills for the presidency and the oceans of difficulties facing the country all gave him pause. I find that interesting. What our text shows us today in Luke chapter 9, it's, it's these very inadequacies, our very insufficiencies and the oceans of difficulties that we face as ministers of the gospel that are actually God's strategy for revealing the superabundant sufficiency of our Lord Jesus Christ. If you would, look with me in Luke chapter 9 as we read. On their return, the return being the first missionary solo journey that the disciples have, we read that in verses 1 to 6. On their return, the apostles told him all that they had done. He took them and withdrew apart to a town called Bethsaida. When the crowds learned it, they followed him, and he welcomed them and spoke to them of the kingdom of God and cured those who had need of healing. Now the day began to wear away, and the twelve came and said to him, Send the crowd away to go into the surrounding villages and countryside to find lodging and get provisions, for we are here in a desolate place. But he said to them, You give them something to eat. They said, we have no more than five loaves and two fish unless we're to go and buy food for all these people. But there were about 5,000 men. Matthew tells us there were also women and children. So there could have been 20, 30, 40,000 people there. And he said to his disciples, have them sit down in groups of about 50 each. And they did so and had them all sit down. And taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing over them. Then he broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples and to set it before the crowd. And they all ate and were satisfied. What was left over was picked up, 12 baskets of broken pieces. Let's pray. Father of grace, we know the central means of transformation is to behold your glory in the face of your Son, Jesus Christ. May your Spirit show us your glory today through your Son, Jesus. We ask this for His sake. Amen. Dr. Stinson told you I worked at a children's home, John Kroll's Big Oak Ranch in Alabama. 
And in 1994, July of 94, I took some of the kids to this July 4th celebration they were having in a park in Gadsden, Alabama. And there was this choir, this church choir, doing a God and Country concert. And on the last song of the concert, they're singing glory, glory, hallelujah, and they begin to set fireworks off. Well, the problem was they set the fireworks stand too close to the choir loft. The fireworks began to come down on top of the choir. Hairspray is flammable. (laughs) And a lady's hair caught on fire in the choir. Well, her husband was in the orchestra. The orchestra was on the side, and I forgot what instrument he had. I think it may have been a trombone or something. He threw his instrument down, and he jumps up on the stage with his sheet music, and he begins to beat her hair, her head, with the sheet music. Now, this woman, her hair is on fire. She's been over at the waist, and she's getting beat in the head by her husband. I'm watching this next to my pastor. But what's amazing, she never quit singing. I don't know if it was out of shock, but this woman is mouthing the words of glory, glory, hallelujah with chaos breaking out around her. I've thought a lot about that. It's been 21 years since it happened. It was before videos on phones, or that would have made a million dollars. But you know, that's a picture of the Christian life. Because of the kingdom that's been inaugurated with our Lord Jesus Christ, because of the new birth that has taken place by God's mercy and grace in our hearts by His Spirit, we have a new song, the Song of the Lamb. And yet we live in the not yet, don't we? We still await the consummation of things. And so chaos breaks out around us as Christians. And yet the mark of the Christian is when the fire falls, we continue to sing the new song of the Lamb, don't we? You know that's why Luke is writing to Theophilus? We don't know who Theophilus is. We can make an educated guess. Luke says that he is writing to the most excellent Theophilus, that he would have certainty concerning the things he's been taught. Now, what's interesting is that some scholars believe that Theophilus may not even be his real name. Loved by God, lover of God, maybe to protect him because he's described as the most excellent Theophilus. And we know from Luke's other book, the book of Acts, Felix and Festus, who were Roman officials, were described as most excellent ones. So it's very likely or possible that Theophilus was a Roman official. And it seems likely that he was a new convert. Luke is writing to this new convert that he would have certainty concerning the things he's been taught. And so if he's a new convert, you know what's going to happen to Theophilus If he's in the Roman government, the fire's going to fall. All hell is going to break loose on this man. Because you can only bow the knee to one Messiah, King Jesus. And so Luke is writing to this man that he would have certainty concerning the things he's been taught concerning Jesus and his kingdom. So that when the fire falls... The office would continue to sing the song of the Lamb. That's why he's writing this. And in our particular text today, it's coming right off the heels of a question. It's an interesting question. It's, it's a question posed by a king, King Herod. And he asks, Who is this about whom I hear such things? So Luke is going to answer that question in our present passage. And in so doing, he's going to confirm Theophilus in his faith concerning Jesus Christ. And he is seeking to confirm Southern Baptist Seminary in your faith today in Jesus Christ 
as well. But ironically, to give Theophilus certainty concerning Jesus, Luke has to show him just how inadequate we are apart from Jesus. Notice with me in verse 10, we see this human inadequacy very apparent in our text. On their return, these apostles told them all that they had done, and he took them and drew apart to a town called Bethsaida. And when the crowds learned it, they followed him. And he welcomed them and spoke to them of the kingdom of God, cured those who had need of healing. Again, this refers back to their first missionary journey. Up till now, up to that first solo journey, the 12 had just basically been riding along bystanders watching Jesus do his thing. But in Luke chapter 8, they see unique displays of his glory. What you see in Luke 8, he actually rebukes wind and waves. How do you rebuke wind and waves? They're in the midst of a hurricane, and he calms the storm by a word. And then uh, they go to this island, and he delivers a man from all these demons on this island. And then he raises Jairus' daughter from the dead and heals a woman who had an issue of blood uh, for 12 years. So these disciples at this point are uniquely primed for their first missionary journey. They have beheld the glory of God in his son Jesus. And now they're reporting all that they had done. Now, it's far from certain, but based on their attitudes in this text, this kind of language here may be that the disciples are a bit too self-aware of what they've accomplished. You know any ministers like that? Fruit comes through your ministry, and then you just become a bit too self-aware. I know I look at one every day in the mirror, and that may be the case here. It's hard to be sure. But that's where the disciples are. And so, by the time their reports end, the crowds are, are just kind of congregating to them. They're, they're pressing to the disciples. And so, Jesus is going to prescribe a retreat at Bethsaida. And we saw as we read the text, verse 12 says it's a desolate place. So, it's likely on the outskirts of Bethsaida somewhere, out in the countryside. And so, when the disciples see them, they begin to move in their direction. And notice in verse 11, I love this. When the crowds learned it, they followed him, and he welcomed them. Isn't that beautiful? He welcomed them. Matthew's account says that he showed compassion. He had compassion for this crowd. You know, this is the turning point of the story. Jesus' compassion, in fact, is always the turning point. It's always. Because without Jesus' compassion, in a world of sin and death and brokenness, things just spiral down, don't they? And we can't fix our problems in and of ourselves, and we certainly can't fix anybody else's problems in and of ourselves. On Saturday, Travis Kearns uh, took us to this mountain that is... 8,000 feet high, and it overlooks Utah County, Provo, Brigham Young. Uh, some 540,000 people live in this county. It's the most lost county in the United States. 99.6% of the people in this county are lost. 99.6%. 540,000 people. Ironically, it's called Happy Valley. And yet, statistically, percentage-wise, it leads the country in suicide, depression prescriptions. You have porn downloads. They lead the country in uh, porn downloads. And even plastic surgery 
Because this need for perfection, this need to look the part, just utter hopelessness. One of the most beautiful things you'll ever see on God's creation. You're looking down on that mountain and yet utter despair and hopelessness. There's a Southern Baptist plant coming there in August. You can pray for it. I don't know the pastor of this plant. He may be the most gifted pastor that the Southern Baptist Convention has ever seen. He may be the most theologically astute pastor our convention has ever seen. But let me tell you, he's not the hope. The only hope is found in the truth that we see in verse 11. Jesus welcomed them. Jesus' sovereign compassion, his compassionate welcome, that's the only hope Utah County has. It's the only hope your ministry has as well. But it's the only hope you need. And note how Jesus' compassion Note how his welcome is expressed. He was teaching them the kingdom of God. I love that. A lot of people today think that when you preach the gospel, that's intolerant. It's the most greatest display of compassion that you can ever show is to proclaim the kingdom. What is the kingdom of God? I was in a large church a few years back and was preaching there. And we met in the study before the service. And the lead deacon was in there to pray. And he also happened to teach the largest Sunday school class in this particular church. And someone asked him, Deacon, what are you teaching today? He said, I'm teaching on the kingdom of God. And he said, what is that? And he said, I don't have the foggiest notion. Well, that's what Jesus taught. It's what is one of the central, if not the central theme of the Bible, is the kingdom of God. So what is it? The kingdom of God is essentially this, the establishment of God's saving reign, his saving rule, authority, and covenantal presence over a broken, sin-cursed creation through his Messiah, through the stem from the stump of Jesse. That's the kingdom of God. It would have also meant that he was preaching the terms of the kingdom. You see, you don't come into a kingdom on your terms. You come on the terms of the king himself, and the terms of the kingdom is repentance, turning from your sin, turning from your sin and trusting in the all-sufficient work of the Messiah, the man Jesus Christ. That's the kingdom of God and the terms of the kingdom. That's what he was teaching them. And notice as well, it says he was curing them, which essentially was signaling the presence of the kingdom. You know, all the way back in the prophets, for instance, Isaiah 35, in the day of the Lord, in the day when the kingdom would come, the new exodus, if you will, the eschatological exodus, one of the ways this day would be signaled is that eyes would be open, blind eyes would be open. Ears, deaf ears would be unstopped. You would have lame people who would be able to leap. And you would have mutes who would be able to sing and speak with joy. And you would have streams breaking forth in the desert. Jesus is signaling by his proclaiming of the kingdom and his curing of all of these diseases that that day is here. And after Jesus had been ministering to them for some time, perhaps hours, the crowd begins to get hungry. Notice in verse 12. Now the day began to wear away. The twelve came and said to him, send the crowd away. Quite bossy to the Lord of the universe. Send the crowd away to go into the surrounding villages and countryside to find lodging and get provisions, for we are here in a desolate place. But he said to them, you give them something to eat. Now John 6, verse 6, his account tells us Jesus was testing them because he knew what he was going to do. 
And I think that's an interesting insight into the ways of our Lord. You see, he tests us not so that he can find out how strong we are. You recognize that, don't you? He tests us so that we can see how inadequate we are apart from him. And it's especially disconcerting for guys like us. We spend years in seminary, don't we? Why are we here? We're getting adequate. We're preparing ourselves to be adequate for our ministry assignments. Jesus tests us to show us that we're not adequate. And all the things that we face on our two journeys, two journeys that Andrew Davis calls the two infinite journeys, the external journey of our role in the kingdom of God and the internal journey of our own progressive sanctification where we're conformed to the likeness of our Lord Jesus Christ, all the things we experience on these two journeys expose that inadequacy. And when we're faced with those limitations and those inadequacies, there's only three options, okay? One is you can look at the situation and you can despair in your own personal walk and in your personal ministry. You can just look at the situation and your own limitations and you can despair. I've done that. Or you can try to fix it yourself. I've done that. Or you can flee in doxological desperation to the God-man who is both seed to the sower and bread to the eater. Well, the disciples choose the first option. You know, Mike Tyson, the great theologian boxer, he once said, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. Jesus is teaching these disciples, and he's teaching Southern Baptist Seminary today. He is the plan. Get all the education you can. I am a big, big proponent of education. Get equipped. Don't short circuit your training. It's crucial. Abraham Lincoln said if he had eight hours to cut down a tree, he'd spend six sharpening the axe. Sharpen your axes. But never lose sight of the fact that Jesus is the plan. The disciples aren't understanding that yet. Notice in the second part of verse 13, they said, we have no more than five loaves and two fish unless we are to go and buy food for all these people. For there were about 5,000 men. This is ironic in light of what they've seen in the first year, year and a half of Jesus' ministry. We saw chapter 8, what they've seen. He rebuked wind and waves. He saw Jairus' daughter raised from the grave. In chapter 7, they saw him raise the widow at Nain's son from the grave. So they've seen two dead people raised from the grave by Jesus. They also saw in chapter 7 that he just spoke a word. The centurion's servant was healed. In chapter 6, they saw him speak to a man with a withered hand. Stretch out your hand. How do you stretch out your hand if it's withered? They saw him heal this man. In chapter 5, they saw him heal a paralytic. They saw him cleanse a leper. And Peter experienced this miraculous catch of fish. He's seen Jesus provide food before. And in chapter 4, Peter actually saw him rebuke the fever of his mother-in-law. And even on their first missionary journey, he had told them to go and take no food with them. And obviously, they had been provided for. So it's ironic that they are responding this way. But the math of the mind, rather than the math of the kingdom, is what's ruling them. Aren't we like that? We're certainly much more like this than probably we care to admit. This math told them that they had finite resources and seeming 
infinite need. That's what the math told them. Do you think this is one of the ways our Lord matures us? I think so. Do you think this is one of the ways he teaches us about his sufficiency? Understand, weakness and inadequacy is not your biggest problem. Your delusion of strength is. That's your biggest problem. That's my biggest problem. It's your delusion of strength. That's where the disciples were. And his grace does its most effective work at the point where our inadequacies are revealed and exposed. And that's why Paul was able to say in 2 Corinthians 12, when I'm weak and I'm strong. Remember what it says of King Uzziah? He was marvelously helped until he became what? Until he became strong. It's at this point we see the adequacy of our Lord Jesus Christ. Notice back in verse 14, he says, He said to his disciples, have them sit down in groups of about 50 each. We don't know why he did that. It's not necessarily important for the understanding of the text. And they did so and had them all sit down. Note the verbs, taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven, said a blessing over them, then he broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples to set before the crowd. So after Jesus breaks the bread, he gave the bread to the twelve, and so Jesus is the one producing here, and the twelve are distributing. This is mediated provision, okay? It's important to understand. It's given by Jesus through the disciples. And to be sure, the, the disciples had a one-of-a-kind ministry, didn't they? Their ministry is foundational. It's the foundation of the church. I was in Utah this week, and I met a lot of people who don't believe that. They believe there are prophets and apostles today who are speaking with, with the same authority these apostles had. They, these guys have a sui generis, a one-of-a-kind ministry. But we do see here a pattern that has a secondary implication to us. It's all God, always God's intention that the order of his kingdom would be expressed through human vice regency. Okay? Human vice regency. But here's the dilemma. And if you don't know this yet, you will learn it in ministry. Whatever we have to offer as human agents is utterly inadequate. It's utterly and woefully inadequate. But here's the glory of the gospel in your ministry. Jesus takes what we have, and by the power of his grace... He uses it, even in your inadequacy. Indeed, Jesus' supply right here, demonstrated in this miracle, overrides, overshadows all of your inadequacies and insufficiencies in ministry. That's the glory that, of, of this miracle that we see. Note the verb here says that he gave them to his disciples. You could translate that literally. He kept giving it to the disciples. I find that quite encouraging. Alexander McLaren says the pieces grew under his touch and the disciples always found his hands full when they came back with their own empty. Isn't that beautiful? With Without the Lord's blessings, five loaves and two fish are utterly inadequate. It's nothing. But with his blessing, abundant supply. That's what this text is teaching us here. Abundant su supply. Note the result, verse 17. They all ate and were satisfied. What was left over was picked up 12 baskets of broken pieces. That word satisfied is interesting. It's the same word that's used in the Sermon on the Plain 
in Luke chapter 6, verse 21. One of the Beatitudes, Jesus said, Blessed are those who hunger, for they shall be satisfied. That's the precondition for being satisfied. If you're sitting here today listless and bored, cold, and different in your walk, you're not hungry enough. You need to ask the Lord to, to work those hunger pains in you. Because when we hunger, he satisfies us. Matthew Henry says, those whom Christ feeds, he fills. And there's always super abundance. Note, the 12 disciples received back 12 baskets. There are commentators who say, that's just a coincidence. I don't think so. You think Jesus is teaching them a lesson here? I think so. This is a miracle, okay? This is what we see, and, and I am proud to preach that here today because the first time I ever heard a liberal preach was on this text. And it was at the Fellowship of Christian Athletes meeting at the University of Alabama. All these football players are gathered in this room, and this director from the Baptist Student Union comes into this room with his diploma, his MDiv from Southern Seminary from the 1970s. And he says, what actually happened is that they gave the little they had and the crowds caught the spirit of generosity. No, this is a miracle. This is a miracle of our Lord Jesus Christ. And it's the only miracle besides the resurrection itself that's included in all four Gospels. Isn't that interesting? I'd have probably included at least Lazarus being raised from the grave in all four Gospels. This is the only miracle that's recorded in all four Gospels. You think it's important? It's very important. This miracle is a loud megaphone reminding us of something we too easily forget in our Christian walks and in our ministries. Our Lord is not limited by your inadequacies. He's not. Actually, our inadequacies are his strategy. His power is made perfect in our weakness. Secondly, this miracle also demonstrates and testifies to the uniqueness of Jesus, the God-man. He's unique. He is the God-man. Just as Yahweh provided the manna in the wilderness as Israel was redeemed out of Egypt and are making their way into their inheritance, and just as we are redeemed out of our bondage and are making our way into our inheritance... Jesus is our provision. He is unique. Psalm 104, verse 28. When you open your hand, you fill them with good hands, with good things. Psalm 104, speaking of Yahweh. This is Jesus, the Son of God. He's the greater Moses. He's the greater Elisha. You know that story in 2 Kings 4, verses 4? 42 and 44. Elisha tells this servant to, to feed 100 men with 20 loaves. I can't feed 100 men with 20 loaves. He said, you feed them. And when he fed them, there was more than enough left over. But we recognize it's not merely food, physical food, that Jesus is providing for in the desolate place. Indeed, Luke has given us a miracle story, and yet this isn't simply about Jesus, the miracle worker. Okay? We need to understand that. It's about every narrative in Luke is about Jesus as our Lord, as our Redeemer, as our Savior. And that's why immediately following this account, you have the great confession of Peter, which is the climax of Jesus' Galilean ministry. You are the Christ of God. And immediately following that confession, we have Jesus' first prophecy, prediction of his death. 
in Luke. The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. Indeed, if you were to flash forward to several months later on a Thursday night, Passover time, okay? The night before Good Friday, Jesus is with his disciples. He's presiding over the Lord's Supper or the Passover meal that he is going to transform into the Lord's Supper. And here's what he says in Luke twenty-two nineteen. 19. He took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them. Note the verbal parallels. Taking, thanking, breaking, giving. Traditionally, the presider of the Passover meal, and it had been this way for 1,470 years, the presider of the Passover meal would take the bread and he would say, this is the bread of our affliction which our fathers ate in the wilderness. But that's not what Jesus says. He says something that has never been said in 1,400 years of the Passover meal. He says, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Ultimately, the feeding of the 5,000 that we see today reflects that Jesus most essentially provides for us in the wilderness by his broken body, by his cross, where he takes the judgment of God for us who believe, where he propitiates the holy and righteous and just and loving wrath of God on sinners like us. That's what this miracle is teaching us. And this miracle points via this transformed Passover meal that's been transformed into the Lord's Supper. It points us to that great messianic feast to come where Jesus will consummate everything he's inaugurated through his cross and his resurrection and his ascension to the right hand of God where he fixes the broken things and he makes the sad things come untrue. And so in this desolate place, in this brief moment in time, we get a glimpse of that day. We get a glimpse of that day. 5,008 and we're satisfied. And it's living in light of these realities as ministers of the gospel and as Christians who are being conformed to the likeness of Christ that provoke us to persevere in singing the new song when the fire falls. You know, Psalm 78, verse 19, the psalmist echoes a very skeptical question posed by those in the wilderness many centuries earlier. Can God make a table in the wilderness? And Luke says, yes, Jesus is that table. As you're being conformed to Christ and your sanctification, he is your bread. He is bread to the eater. And as you go about as agents of the kingdom, his message is your seed as the sower. That's what Luke has to teach us today. Thank you.